Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, we have uh, some of the most uh, successful founders uh, in Southeast Asia with us. We have uh, Richard, who's the most profitable fintech in Singapore, the first guy ever to raise more than 100 million uh, in Singapore. Uh, Brad, who is the most valuable fintech in Myanmar right now, did was the she used to have that title in uh, Cambodia before, now in Myanmar. So one country after another. And Val, uh, who is one of the most uh, uh, successful insurtech founders in Singapore, the first company ever to get into the regulatory sandbox and founder of uh, digital insurance sales. So she was the first one to ever accomplish that and get regulatory approval to do insurance sales digitally. And all of them have gone through a lot of partnerships, collaboration, and everybody reaches out to them because they are the face of industry in their own realms. And they are inundated with requests. So one thing I was talking to them uh, a few minutes back was, uh, when you receive so much inbound traffic, uh, when you have random introductions and LinkedIn emails coming in all over, how, how do you prioritize? How do you define who to talk? Because you don't want to piss off people. You don't want to sound too arrogant, but you just don't have bandwidth to entertain everybody. So how, how does it feel like being in that position? And how, how, do, you, how do you navigate? Uh, Richard, if maybe we start from you first, because you are in a very deep tech space and yet so popular. Um, not so sure about the last point, though. Um, because uh, ourselves are uh, being a B2B fintech space, uh, in the B2B fintech space, we tend to be flying under the radar. Uh, so you do not see us very much uh, out there because we are not consumer facing. Mm -hmm. Our clients are, so we are B2B to see. Now, uh, throughout this whole journey of about almost 10 and a half years and counting, uh, I must say we have gone through a lot of ups and downs and a lot of uh, pitfalls that we hope that fellow uh, startups uh, will be able to maybe avoid paying the tuition because it can be quite painful and sometimes it will kill us, right? Uh, I, I would like to maybe look at uh, such partnerships uh, maybe into kind of three groups, borrowing a movie title, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, if I may. Um, so the good ones are the ones that um, they look at all these fintech partnerships as a, a, a laboratory yeah. experiment, something which they couldn't do it in-house uh, and some see as cooperation, meaning cooperate with the competition and others see us as the aggregator or distribution mm -hmm. channel. So it's actually all good because it shows that there's complementary synergy in that. The bad ones are the ones who they sometimes get us to do unpaid work for a very extended period of time. Uh, and they call it um, MOUs, uh, POCs, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of very fancy, fancy terms, which means that you're not paid. It's almost like a corporate-wide internship for six months, nine months, sometimes more than two years. I would hope that you land a contract, but it's never guaranteed. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, they will jump in the moment you sign another mm -hmm. contract with someone else bigger. And then they'll say, hey, you know, I was here first and I want to have it. So these are the second category. The third ones, the the you know the ugly ones are the ones who, essentially, uh, from the start they have no intention of collaborating, but they will want to get some ideas from you, uh, services for free, they string some of these promo startups along for a very very long period of time, and even after, even if they were to invest in you, uh, could be large amount, small amount, you thought that you broke the uh, jackpot. You, you could have all of their business you know, coming to you, but that's not the case. They were more interested in what you can get business from elsewhere coming to you through them. So if you think that after signing, getting an investment, everything will be a fairy tale ending, uh, a lot of time it may not be true. But of course, this may hopefully be the exception rather than over back to you, Mary. So, so Val, do you see also similar distribution and and uh, additional quick question? How will you split like which? How much of these inbound partnerships are in which category in your experience? Uh, I think Richard covered most of it. That I think almost every startup founders will have experience that like from 
really long discussion on like, okay, uh, we're really interested, like say maybe FIs or like some big partners uh, that are really well known, reach out and say that they want to partner together with us, uh, go through length of uh, discussion and say that, oh, uh, it has to be a free POC to actually prove that it works before they can uh, get the budget approved. So like, of course, in the early stage, we felt that like, hey, every of this kind of big brand will support us to get like maybe another paid partnership eventually that can help the company grow. So like, I think I think ultimately for every startup founder or like any other uh, FYs looking for partnership in the future, alignment is key because like wrong kind of partnership is really a waste of resources on both parties. The time of uh, working on deliver uh the tech integration, uh, then in the end, if let's say both sides didn't work out, like the results are not achieved, and then maybe the, the change of management, because we work with like big organization like the insurance companies, and sometimes they when the management change, uh, their goal change as well, and it affects uh, like startup momentum. Because like ultimately we are quite a lean team, right? So like the amount of effort we put in, sometimes uh, it, it just drag on uh, for a long period of time when we we are responsible to actually like fulfill what like has been promised. On top of that, uh, is actually like what we also notice is like are we targeting uh, the right customer base or like say what Richard has mentioned? Like maybe maybe uh, you think that like probably with this kind of partnership or investment, you can tap onto their, their customer base. But actually, their intention is that they hope you will bring in uh, new new business or new customers in. So, like, it, the alignment must be key. Uh, if let's say there's mismatch of, like, expectation, uh, mid to long term will be will be challenging. Because it's always fairy tale when we start, uh, like, oh, the immediate things that we see that can be happening. But a partnership sometimes can 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 actually entail a, a very long process yeah uh, and brad how do you see like do you see something different in myanmar or it's it's also the similar story in there i think it's a similar story i mean the way we look at partnerships i think the question we ask at the beginning of a partnership is what's the customer problem we're trying to solve and and can with the tools that we have can we actually solve that customer problem together so if i, if I think to some of our more successful partnerships um, so, the, one of the biggest consumer finance companies in the country uh, came to us actually for to see whether we could help them with collections using our agent network. Um, so we're now collecting 60 to 70 percent of their collections every month of a customer base in the hundreds of thousands of customers. So that's a real value-adding partnership for us, right? Because um, we're actually getting customers. Uh, it solves a massive pain point for them around collections. And so that's a very happy partnership. Um, similarly, you know, there was a customer problem to be solved around pensioners in the country. The pensioners get their pensions every month. These are retired civil servants and so on. Um, to get your pension in the country, you had to go to a government bank and you'd often wait five or six hours to get your pension, right? And these are elderly people sitting in bank branches for five or six hours. And they're not bank branches the way you guys would imagine DBS, right? In Singapore, these are pretty basic bank branches. Um, no air conditioning or things like that. So. Um, so the problem to be solved was, could we get a digital wallet in the hands of, of these pensioners and actually distribute pensions uh, digital, digitally? And we solved that problem and we're now doing pension payments for thousands of pensioners per month. So that, that, that's a great partnership for us uh, with government. But I think that's, that's the real question. If you can jointly solve a problem that benefits customers, then I think that's the, the key to a good partnership. Got it. Absolutely. That, that's that's very valuable. And, and in terms of like structuring the process, do you see like a handshake having value in these days? Uh, and specifically now the meetings are having virtual. So how do you quantify this? How do you qualify that? Okay, this is genuine. This is not genuine. Is, is signing an MOU or doing like a virtual event together? Like how, how, to, how to play with this? So I'm just looking from a perspective of new young founders who are looking at it. How do they qualify? How, how do they segment? And when do they know that this is real? How, how to how to do it? How to check it? How to evaluate it? Is there is there some something you could share like in terms of guidance for them? Richard, can, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Brad. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, for young founders, one of the tips I would say is that partnerships can give you great press. You know, I think um, in our early days when we looked at different partnerships, we would often do joint 
press conferences and press releases and so on, talking about the benefits, talking about what we're going to do for customers. And, and that helped us, uh, particularly as a young company, get some great growth in the market. So I think young founders can actually, you know, off, and often if you're able to develop partnerships with much bigger organisations, it can give your smaller organisation a bit of a halo effect from actually developing that partnership and using the, the size of the entity um, to uh, to really drive your your, uh, your your own business along. So I would say for young founders, I think, um, and for smaller companies, you know, look look to partners that can help further your brand and see if you can get some of the halo effect off that. Okay. Right. Yeah. To add on it, I think it's actually um, like what I talk about setting alignment, right? Is that like, are we able to tap onto each other resources uh, to reduce any expenses, could be marketing, uh, technology development, uh, leveraging on uh, example, could be licenses of like cross-border uh, expansion opportunity because uh, regulations are in place, especially in the FinTech space. Um, so like, I think before we start on live, uh, Richard and Brad were already talking about collaboration opportunity. So like, we, uh, just within startup itself, like there are a lot of opportunities that we can uh, explore that like we can tap onto this kind of existing capabilities that we have already established and how can we work together uh, to scale it even faster. On top of that, uh, it's actually uh, like each party will have our own customer base and network, right? So like how can, how can we do cross uh, like promotion, uh, more than just an EDM, is uh, testing into, uh, testing and looking into like embedding each other services uh, into like the customer journey. So um, if we talk about like like uh, two big financial institutions like Ethica and Singtel just also did a, a collaboration where Singtel do not have an insurance company license and then like Ethica uh, offer digital uh, like uh, savings plan. So they have this kind of partnership where uh, basically, uh, on, on Dash itself, the Singtel e-wallet, you can actually start buying the uh, insurance product. So I believe that the, because of the customer segment that they are interested uh, to tap onto both sides, uh, this, this way uh, we can actually start looking at like, okay, for us as a startup in the future when we want to work with uh, e-wallets like how can we actually uh, support on that on, on that portion so like for us uh, now being part of AMTD digital uh, like family right we're looking at um, down the road with the digital bank license uh, we are we are looking to actually support uh, on the bank assurance being a digital bank assurance provider so that um, as a digital bank they do not have to actually get their own like in, uh, insurance license or distribution license uh, it's about all this kind of collaboration that we can work on and one, one important point which i realized when you mentioned about the collaboration and even, so how do you define the data ownership in these kind of partnerships uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, so many times it depends on like uh, what kind of support that is provided from yeah, each party. So like say for example, uh, if let's say the anonymized data I shared from the digital bank and then uh, policy health is the one that fulfills the insurance products. So end of the day, uh, the policy holder uh, like belongs to policy pal and the insurer who have uh, provided the insurance policy. But uh, as a as a bank partner, where like say for example, AMT the digital, they will have access uh, to the anonymized information that like the customer has shared with uh, like policy pal. So customer data and the ownership lies on who fulfills the like that service or the product. But then of course it down it boils down to like how what's the level of uh, discussion and like customer consent because uh it's also we have to comply with pdpa so so one other question related to this same point was a lot of times i've heard founders say that real partnerships are when there is a skin in the game and the larger guy the financial institution or the consumer group is actually putting some money in the table so that they have skin in the game Versus the other side, they say that I don't want them on my cap table. They will create more more challenges for me. I don't want them on my cap table. So, do you have like specific views around like is there a is there a gold answer or it depends or how, how do you guys look at getting the strategic partners on your cap table or not having them on cap table? Um, I yeah, I think maybe I let Richard answer this. <laughs> oh, it's, it's great. 
Richard, you have the you have the you have the you have the biggest giants on your cap tables. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would say um, it's not a kind of a one situation uh, fits all. Uh, skin in the game is very important. They were from time to time large institution when they want to partner with a startup, they will say, okay, well, for me to be on your cap table, there's reputation risk, right? And therefore, I'm willing to have reputation risk and therefore that's the skin in the game. In effect, what they were asking for was sweat capital, which usually come as a shock to the startup. It's like, look, you know, we are small, we are burning on fumes. You wanted, you know, five, 10, whatever percent of the company and you want it for free. And you were saying that because you're putting your reputation in as capital. So this is sometimes a, a pretty much of a disconnect between the startup and the large institution, because to them it's a rounding error, right? Uh, and yet to the startup, you know, even a $250,000 investment at the early stage counts, a uh, 2 million at the mid stage counts a lot. So this is where sometimes the large and the small guys uh, do have a bit of a vocabulary disconnect. On the other uh, ex extreme end of the spectrum, whereby how big is the investment too big? Not in dollar value, but in percentage term. Clearly, if you are more than 50%, you are no longer independent. But there are also many institutions that the moment they invest up to a third uh, or to 40-45%, in their internal policy, they regard you as a subsidiary. Even though accounting rules says is equity accounting, you are just an affiliate because you're between 20 to 49.999, but they consider you to be internal. And with that, you will have to start absorbing all their terminologies when it comes to how you rank your people during your end exercise. What do you call certain things? What is the business plan called in their terminology? In other words, they put the entire governance on you, whatever the corporate governance structure on this tiny little company. And that might be stifling because a lot of time you spend uh, half of your admin headcount instead of trying to do work but basically to do monthly reporting, uh, weekly sharing of business plan targets, uh, you essentially you are reporting to them. And uh, it's usually not one person, it's a committee. Right? So it's very important to be careful to understand this question, which is at what trigger point would the investment cost you, the portfolio company, to be regarded as a uh, subsidiary in their mind? If the answer is 33%, then don't go beyond 33% because you essentially lost independence. So it's the cost of autonomy question. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I might add to that as well. Yes, we, 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 we've had, uh, so, so I mean, the, the definition of partnership is very broad, of course, right? It can go from investors through to merchants, through to, to uh, government or whatever. But if I look at investors, we've gone through a very interesting journey with wave money. <clears throat> so firstly, we've had one of the biggest telcos in the world, Telenor, out of Norway. Then we've had Yoma Bank slash Yoma Group, which is the, a large conglomerate in Myanmar. Um, I would say you couldn't put together two more diverse shareholders than that. Um, you know, sort of Norwegians and then um, Myanmar, Hong Kong Chinese um, coming together to form a partnership. But I think it's been a very effective partnership because every part, every every component of that has brought different elements of value. So Telenor did bring a lot of the governance that we needed as a as a growing, fast growing company. Um, to be successful. Yoma Group brought that very much that entrepreneurial spirit um, and also the leverage that we got from the bank, particularly from a cash management perspective. But um, we've now got Telenor exiting the, the shareholding. They're now focusing on their core business. So they, they, they're moving out of financial services in Myanmar. But we're bringing in Ant Financial um, in the $73 million investment that was actually announced recently. And once again, I think it's the perfect partner at the right time because Myanmar is going digital very, very quickly, and we're bringing in a partner who <coughs> arguably <coughs> has been um, one of the most successful digital financial services companies in the world. <coughs> so I feel very fortunate that we've had, we have had the right partners in the cap table at, at the right time. And I think going forward, <coughs> we'll look to leverage that digital expertise off air, um, which I think will, will, will accelerate us again. So. Um, but, it, it, you know, as a CEO of an organisation like that, you've got to really work very hard on managing those partners and managing those investors to make sure that you all stay on the same path. And I think for us, you know, we do a lot of work on strategy every year and we make sure the partners are very bought into that strategy um, and so that we're all going on the same page. So I think getting the rules right, getting the governance right, getting 
expectations of the shareholders and investors right, uh, and then having the right partners at the right time. Got it, got it. And while you were saying something? Um, I think basically I was about to talk more about like uh, the partnership, right? Uh, end of the day, uh, it depends very much on like uh, the, the, the company's uh, vision. Uh, so for example, during the early stage, uh, like we, we did get like some interest from the insurance companies to receive the funding as a strategic partner and also investor. But like being a broker, we 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 want to stay open as a platform. So uh, like it, it, it depends very much on the company's like vision. If let's say uh, you feel that like the support from a specific insurance company can help you scale, uh, then of course like you can take on the investment and uh, the, the, uh, the kind of uh, support. But then and of course, with that, uh, you also close the door to the rest of the insurance partners that potentially you work with. So I think it's very important uh, to have that kind of uh, 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 analysis and look at like, okay, what do you want to do, achieve uh, long term? And then like, uh, because in, if let's say you do take the money at an early stage, six stage, series A, um, like later on, you might be saying bye to the rest of the like potential partnership where it uh, enable you to scale a lot more. Got it, got it. And one another thing regarding this, which I've heard is that the key thing is how stable is your sponsor in partnership on the other side? Because while you are doing the partnership, if that person leaves, the whole thing changes. So how, how, how much do you think the partnership is dependent on the sponsor versus the organization? And where's the line where you know that the company is backing or is the person backing and when he leaves or she leaves, it's over? I, I can I can carry on. So basically, um, end of the day, company is made out of people, and um, for for us for the like past four years, uh, many times it's about having a sponsor and the champion within the uh, big organization who really understand like uh, what we can achieve together when we when when both parties uh, work on this partnership. On top of that is about like how this champion or uh, sponsor will have a team to support him if let's say he or she were to leave the organization. So um, I still believe that like like we have to establish this kind of uh, like uh, sponsorship relationship uh, and 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 it's more than just a company level because company is is still made up of like people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But. Uh, Brad, have you? How do you look at like the depending? Because you deal with global organization and global partners. So, how much do you see continuity in terms of the partnership strategy in the larger organization? And what's the? Are there? What are the best practices to ensure that there is continuity at the organization side beyond people's job tenures? Yeah, I think you've got to you've got to set up structures. You know, I think. Um, one thing we've learned in Sideways Money, I mean, we, we've grown from in 2015 when I first came to Myanmar, there was only a couple of people working on it. We had, I think, 50 staff at the end of the first year. Uh, we're up to about 260 staff now. We'll grow to 300 by the end of this year. When you start getting to an organisation as big as that, you've got to really have the right structures in place for continuity. Um, and that's sort of in terms, in terms of engaging with partners as well. So... Um, you know, we're going through a, a bit of a refresh in our leadership team currently to make sure that, you know, beyond my tenure, beyond the tenure of, of some of my key executives, you know, I've got another wave of people coming through now who, who will be part of the organisation for the next five or six years. So I think a lot of it's about having the right structure and, and you know, the, the partnerships can never be about just an individual and, and the relationship with one person in the organisation. So, yeah, you know, the partnerships need to be embraced organisationally and institu institutionally and, uh, and, and, and set up with the right structures. And Farun, I think your question was really about the key believer and sponsor on the other side. Uh, if they were to have uh, left, would the relationship between the organisations still be intact? Uh, it's a very um, kind of depends on the situation kind of question. Uh, clearly, in order for this to work, we usually have a believer, champion, sponsor on the other side who basically wanted to drive this and make this thing happen. And eventually it happened. And then, uh, you know, after a few months, a few years, 
this person may have moved on to another role or left the organization. So the challenge very often for the smaller one, the startup, is how do you continue to have insights and the inroads into the senior management team on the other side uh, in the event of a change of guts? Uh, sometimes we get it right. Uh, more often, uh, we didn't get it quite right because it's very hard for you to know who is the new person who's going to come in, right? And it's very hard for you to preempt that and build a relationship. Uh, and very often, even if you have the very good day-to-day -day working relationship with the entire team, once their boss change, uh, a lot of the uh, strategy might change. This new person may say, I used to like, okay, you know, my predecessor likes A, now I want to do B. And we are part of A, not B. Therefore, we will no longer be flavor of the month. So that's a real uh, danger that's uh, uh, um, facing many of us. So the solution might be to have more than one key partnership. If the entire startup is aligned with one or two very, very big organization, great business to have because it starts you off immediately on the higher ground. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's a scary place to be because the moment someone at the top changes their mind and suddenly you are not sort of in this new future state, uh, mm -hmm. you have a plan B or plan C, right? Uh, and, and that's some, something which I think all of us will always need to have. Not just a plan B, but a plan C. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have actually been in the situation before where an investor um, changed their risk appetite towards a particular investment, and it is a very frustrating process. I can tell you, and I think um, the reflection I would actually have from that that time is that um, I should have been more upfront with that particular investor and actually said to them, "Look, your risk appetite's changed. Let's start a process of dilution or or exit, so that you can um, you know you, you can do do what you want to do, right?" I think that that was a key learning that I actually had uh, out of that because um, eventually, you know, I, I think often organisations, when their risk appetite or their strategy changes, often they take too long to make the decision. So I think uh, founders, if they find that they actually have investors inside their cap table that, that have a change of strategy or have a risk appetite change, I think it's important for them to actually have that dialogue with the investors and, and say, look, you know, do you really want to remain in the shareholding? So I think that was a key learning from about 10 years ago. So uh, I, I think you can work out what, which one I'm talking about. But, yes, uh, yes. So, but it, it, was, it was fairly painful, but a very, a very good learning experience. So. Absolutely, that's, that's very valuable. The other question is usually the obsession with exclusivity. Uh, some founders have said that under no circumstance uh, shall I sign in exclusivity because you are not signing one with me. Versus the large company says, I am large, I can, you cannot demand one model. So what's your view around this exclusivity barrier either way uh, from, from the large side to the small side or the small to large side? Or have you seen these exclusivity clauses being thrown at you? All the time. <laughs> How do you navigate them, Richard? Uh... Is it like that there is a price at which it's exclusive or there is no price at which it is exclusive? I mean, when it comes to China, for instance, uh, the the whole pie is really carved into kind of two large ones in a certain space. And if you're in one camp, uh, it's quite natural for this camp to tell you you can't do business with the other camp. And guess what? Even if they don't say you go to the other camp and mm -hmm. attempt to paddle your wares, they're going to say you are from the other side. Don't come and talk to me, right? So a lot of times uh, when you sign up, you have to understand that uh, once you take on this, uh, it will also means that uh, a certain part of the market uh, will always be uh, out of reach. And so this exclusivity is something which can be contractual. It can be just the way it works. Uh, and it's a double-edged sword. Uh, I haven't got enough experience uh, still living through it, uh, how to navigate it. Uh, I guess it takes a lot of... Uh, learning from everybody to figure things out. And hopefully we don't make the same mistake twice. Yeah. Brad, have you seen exclusivity being thrown at you? Um, or thrown the other way, yeah. I think, um, uh, it, look, to me, exclusivity can be appealing to young companies because, you know, they, they might say, oh, great, there's a distribution platform here that I can leverage or whatever. Um, I, I would just say that, um, you know, young founders who are, who are looking at exclusivity arrangements just handle with care you know and there, there has to be sufficient value 
for it to occur, um, and and sort of look at it on a on a on its own merits. So I think you know it may be it may be a good path, or or it could be um, extremely debilitating. So I think um, yeah, I, I think there has to be enough in it to to give give, give that away because I think exclusivity is actually a, a significant thing to give away. And Ralph, I have, have you, I'm sure you have been thrown this exclusivity thing. How have you navigated it? Yeah, I think like, uh, yeah, it has always been. And uh, especially during the early stage when uh, we have the uh, like uh, policy management tool, right? Basically, insurance company just say that, why not just like give it to me and then I label it as like, uh, insurer ABC uh, like platform and uh, we always say no so it depends on like your business strategy so we say no to that but we have said yes to certain kind of exclusivity such as uh, uh, product creation so when we want to come up with new insurance product uh, insurance company asks uh, that like if if this specific product they are doing the underwriting and putting in all the resources for us, um, we both should have exclusivity for about six months. And like we said yes to that because basically we also understand that the amount of resources and also the marketing effort that like both sides put in. Uh, so we're open to like explore exclusivity only for a certain period of time thereafter of course they can open it up to distribute this the same type of product like on their own platform and also for us like we can work with other partners so um like um, i think i think it's case by case basis yeah. got it and, and now that we are in, in going towards the end the last part i had to ask mm -hmm. was now that everything has moved by force in virtual do you see the way we do partnerships change and like Things will be normalized in maybe six months, one year. But do you see the way partnerships being done changed for good? Or do you see we will be back to where we were in terms of partnerships? Because a lot of these partnerships are always about FaceTime, uh, having those long lunches or drinks and stuff. So uh, do you see it going to normal or this will be the new way of partnerships going forward? I can have a of that one to begin with. I think the first thing for us is the COVID time we've seen our partnerships accelerate. It's been incredible. I mean, companies that we've been talking to two or three years about um, digital disbursement or digital collections, um, all of a sudden were banging on our door. You know, microfinance institutions that all of a sudden couldn't collect repayments. Um, you know, so, so partnerships for us during this time has actually been a, a huge opportunity and, and we've onboarded dozens of new partners um, because of the, the situation. But it's a big upside for us, actually. Okay. Okay. And uh, for you, Val and uh, Richard? Richard. Uh, so for us, I think it's, uh, things are a lot more straightforward now. So like basically, we, we already know some of the partners. Uh, so the discussion is like much more upfront on like what we can do together. And uh, the timeline of launch uh, has also been shortened. Uh, last time used to be, oh, uh, probably we can re re review it like down the road and, and all. But right now, because of uh, COVID, as like everyone is moving towards digitalization, uh, like the speed of implementation has also improved. Uh, but of course, like we, we don't know when the vaccine will come and when people will really go back to the normal. And is there a, a, a chance for us to go back to the normal? So if this continues, then of course, uh, down the road, I think partnership is going to change because people will be a lot more upfront on like, what is it like both sides want to achieve? And then like that, we can set that kind of uh, expectation alignment. Uh, what is it that we want to achieve? Other than um, a lot of, uh, I think last time we used to have a lot of FaceTime, like uh, or casual conversation about, oh, maybe we can explore X, Y, Z over lunch or dinner. Uh, but now things are much more precise. <laughs> Got it, got it, got it. And Richard, what, what do you think as the last words on this? Uh, well, I, I think uh, the thing about COVID is that nobody knows when it's going to end. And uh, business travelers are probably not going to uh, be revived back to where we were for a pretty long time. You know, some are saying maybe even at the mid or end of next year. So that's uh, not a bad thing because uh, for those businesses and partners who have been delaying many of the work that they need to do simply by saying, hopefully you open up very, very soon and let's carry on there. Now they're starting to say, assume this is the new norm, this is the new normal. So life goes on, business as usual, what can we do? 
So even during this time, we have managed to launch the high exchange uh, partnership, uh, even though uh, our last trip there was in February and we missed all the joint uh, meetings, the collaboration face to face, but we carry on on the digital way. So I guess the organization begin to understand that there's no more need to wait for things to happen. Just do it, but a new digital way, because this is the new normal. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for sharing this uh, valuable insights. Really appreciate it. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye.